Let there be light, and there was light, which dispelled the darkness of ignorance. Swast Avlon is an attempt to infuse the light of good health into our lives by equipping ourselves with information about healthy lifestyle. Let us begin today's ceremony with the lighting of the lamp for which I call upon our inspiring principal Ananta Ma'am and our enlightened panelists Dr. Shilpa Aroskar and, and Mrs. Ruchi Mathur. or the other. We have child malnutrition at one end and on the other end we are battling alarming rates of child obesity. Since ages we have associated prosperity with plump kids and we have been stuffing them with lot of food. But in the past they used to burn it organically by playing all other games possible. Today outdoor games are a luxury which all urban kids are not privy to because of several unavoidable reasons. Today, we are going to deconstruct the myth that chubbiness corresponds to good health with Dr. Shilpa Aroskar. She heads the Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology at Reliance Hospital, Navi Mumbai. With a vast spanning experience of 25 years in comprehensive newborn, child and adolescent care. A doctor who fortunately for us belongs to our Avon family. She is also a celebrated author with her humorous bestsellers, YOLO and Ubuntu. Driven by a heart that never hardens, temper that never tires, and a touch that heals, it is an honor to be listening to you today. She is joined by none other than Dr. Bandita Sinha who is Chief Consultant in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Reliance Hospital, Copacay. Being active in the medical field for more than two decades, Dr. Sinha is also associated with many social awareness programs for school, colleges and underprivileged women. A speaker and faculty for many national conferences, it is our honor that we can avail this opportunity to brainstorm with Mrs. Ruchi 
Oxford has a master's degree in advanced human nutrition. She has diverse experience having collaborated with Care India in working with the undernourished tribals in Chhattisgarh, managing nutrition communication along with developing new products for Nestle India, counseling aspiring young sports people at Dr. D.Y. Patil Sports Academy, as well as personal nutrition and diet consulting. This session is being moderated by our very own Anahita Ma'am. May I please request you, Ma'am, to take over. It's scary when teachers ask questions, you know, <laughs> whatever age you are. So, uh, Namaste and a very good morning. I should be actually saying that. I've never been a moderator before. This isn't my subject. And I'm imagine moderating something which is related to health and obesity. Okay. So once again, thank you very much, children. Namaste and a very good morning to all. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for investing your time today with us on a Saturday morning. It's a pleasure both to participate, you know, in the panel, uh, also with these esteemed panelists that we have, and of course, to welcome all of you today. Now the topic for today's discussion is being chubby is not necessarily being healthy. So I'm sure you've all heard that, uh, you know, there are children who, who are becoming more obese day by day. Let me tell you, India is now getting into the number one position in no time. So experts are calling this as the obesity epidemic. Somewhere where we are feeding our children so much out of love and concern that children are actually becoming more obese day by day. So initially, I think we first need to understand what is obesity. And for that, we are going to first call upon our first panelist, which is Dr. Shilpa. Shilpa, ma'am, can you please tell us what is childhood obesity mean? And uh, you know, when can we actually say that the child is obese? Also, are there any uh, particular cutoffs or any kind of tests which tell us that the child is obese? Very, very good question and very relevant. Uh, especially in Indian household, you know, khate pite ghar ka bacha. And I remember I'm practicing since 25 years, and every parent who comes into the consulting room is, it's like that drill, self excel add, you know, uski kamis, meri kamis se sabbek kaise, uska bacha mere bacha se mota healthy kaise. So we have this so much ingrained in our minds that chubby is healthy, but chubby is chubby and not healthy. Now, to put it in medical language, uh, when we say that what is over, what is healthy, what is overweight, and what is obesity. So healthy is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a child who is slightly maybe overweight by one or two kilos. I'm going to show in the graphs uh, once I finish talking. Uh, when we say overweight child, that means the weight of the child is more uh, than the height for the age. So at, for every age of 1 year old, 3 year old, 10 year old, we have uh, limits, you know, what we brought as percentage on the growth chart. So all over the world, the WHO, we have WHO growth charts and here in India, we follow the Indian growth charts because if we compare, we cannot compare us or our children to the western standards. Because westerners, they are taller than us, they are, their weight is on the more side. So you can't have the same chart all over the world. So when the weight is more than the height for a particular age, we label it as overweight. But when we call obesity is when there is excessive fat in the body, then we label that child as obese and obesity is it, it's a disease we just can't label it you know as something physiological or something which is not normal because of excessive eating or lack of physical activity no it's a disease as bad as a cancer because it is the beginning or it puts the seed in the child's body for uh, multiple diseases which can remain lifelong so uh, can somebody open the PPT because I want to show that how we uh, uh, label as obese. So you 
बहुत ही क्यूट लगता है बहुत ही हमको अच्छा लगता है ऐसे बच्चे बट ये अच्छे नहीं है बट दिस इज आर इंडियन साइकिल I already quoted this yesterday that obesity is not because it runs in family, but it is because no one runs in the family. <laughs> okay. So this is what I said that uh, obesity means excess body fat, and it is measured by something called as BMI, body mass index. So when we plot on the growth chart, we look at a percentile. Okay. Now, if the child is into fifth to eighty-fifth centile, then we say that it is normal. Now, when the child is in eighty-fifth to ninety-fifth centile, we say that its child is overweight. But any child at any age group, uh, uh, you know, uh, is in the ninety-fifth centile or above, then we uh, label it as uh, obesity. I'll just show the graphs. So, if you see the graph, we have two kinds of graph in India. The pink graph uh, are for girls, and the blue for boys. And uh, if you can see on the graph, I don't know whether you can see clearly. There are different different centiles. So, we we measure the child's weight and height. We calculate the BMI, and then we plot plot on the graph. So, anything above 85th centile is a red flag sign that you can work on it and reverse. But anything above 95th centile is you have missed the bus. You know, and uh, uh, you really have to work on it, and then we label it as a pathological disease. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, coming to Dr. Bandita, Dr. Bandita, you know, uh, it said that a mother's diet and the lifestyle choices that she adopts matter a great deal, and which will also influence, you know, a baby's future behavior and maybe body composition. Is that true? Yes, it's absolutely true. But uh, I'm very sad to say that uh, nowadays mothers don't understand that. So, because it's not that we are going ahead and becoming modern and having a modern lifestyle. That does not mean that uh, uh, we should not take good care of our health. Because we still, nowadays we see mothers who are coming to us and uh, we usually, once she is pregnant and the uh, test is positive, and we usually tell them certain do's and don'ts, especially related to the diet plan, and to avoid any kind of junk foods, too much of sugary foods, preservatives, and all outside food. So these are the basic things which we tell them. Ki please don't take them, especially for the first three months. Where the first three months are very very important because at that time the organogenesis happens. The baby is formed. The whole baby is formed in the first twelve weeks of life. Okay. But then there is a notion that uh, uh, first three months में क्या होता है? Baby के अंदर तो जान ही नहीं है, तो how does it uh, have an implication of whatever I am eating? It's not that that way. The day when the fertilization happens, the day when the uh, pregnancy test is positive, it is alive. Even if it is a two cell, even if it is a four cell, it is alive. That is why it is growing, right? So in that condition, if we are having any kind of food items. Which have a preservative, which have any kind of toxic ingredient. Even to say there are certain uh, medicines also. People are now uh, going ahead and taking lots of medicines, multivitamins and everything, which is available over the counter. So there are many ingredients which are not allowed in the first three months also, because a small amount of toxin can also create a genetic deformity in the growing baby. Second thing is that those who are having any hormonal issues, or suppose a mother is having PCOD uh, during a pre-pregnant stage, and then she becomes pregnant, or there is a history of hypertension in the family, diabetes in the family. So there are chances when these ladies become uh, pregnant, those familial disorders can give an expression because during the pregnancy there is a stress on the body. And due to that stressful condition, she might become a uh, diabetic during the pregnancy, which we call a uh, gestational diabetes or pregnancy-related hypertension. So those cases are more and more uh, are being seen nowadays, just because we are uh, not into a good life, good dietary uh, thing, exercise before we are becoming pregnant, and even during the pregnancy also. There are mothers who do not give up eating outside food or any kind of junk food. 
I'm not saying here everything which is being served outside is uh, not good, but then we need to understand the high calorie food especially. If you are not working out that much and you are taking high calorie food, you are having lots of preservatives, lots of white sugar, white flour. So definitely during pregnancy, they, that is the sugar level is going to be high. The uh, blood pressure is going to be high, and that is going to affect the growing baby. And when these babies are born, even during the pregnancy, by the time they reach six, seven, eight months, we see lots of complications on those babies. There can be preterm babies. There can be overweight babies, and the babies who are born as Dr. Shilpa said, as chubby. So it's, during the birth, they are very happy. Ki, uh, 3.8 kg ka baby ho gaya, so 4 months ke baby ke jaisa lag raha hai. But then we are not that happy to see a that chubby baby at the time of delivery because these will be the potential babies who can develop uh, childhood uh, diabetes, uh, who can develop later on PCOD. And all these things, the initiation starts right from the womb. If the mother is taking very good care of herself, she is very particular about her diet, definitely that baby, she is giving a gift to that baby for the lifetime. So we need to understand it's not only after the baby is born and we are feeding all good things to the baby. It's about what I am doing before I got pregnant and during the whole pregnancy. That's very, very important. I think that's surprised. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Ruchi, uh, right now ma'am was talking about, uh, you know, the right kind of nutritional value that the mother needs to have. It gets really difficult because we normally live in joint families where we have our grandmothers and our mothers and our aunts who all come along and say that, Aaj ye laddu hai, ye ka, aaj paratha extra khalo. Yeah. Ek aadmi ke liye mat khao, do aadmi ke liye khao. I think this is the normal, you know, phrase that we normally hear. And so I wanted to ask you, what should be uh, an adequate kind of a diet for a lady who's expecting, who is, uh, of course, carrying a child, and what would be the appropriate ingredients, or I would say the essential nutrients for her? The thing is that, yes, as soon as uh, you know, it's announced in the family that this lady is expecting, everybody says, OK, you eat for two, you eat for two. The biggest misconception is that eating more is healthy. You need more of nutrients. You don't necessarily need more of fat and of energy, just basic energy. Because any food that is giving you only energy and no other nutrients is actually what is called junk food for any age group. Any food that gives you nothing else but energy is called a junk food. So what we are trying to look for is wholesome food, nutritionally wholesome food, which the pregnant mother will need. And as far as the requirements increase go that you discussed, that happens only after six months. For the first six months, what she's eating is fine. Only her diet should be nutritionally balanced. She needs more of certain vitamins to avoid certain deficiencies which would cause, you know, congenital defects in the baby. So she needs to be nourished properly but not uh, fattened. Huh. And not fattened, you know, there's a misconception that fat is what's going to bring out everything and that is the misconception, it is the nutrients, you need proteins, you need all those vitamins and minerals in whatever minute quantities, but if there is an imbalance there, that is what is affecting the growth of the baby. And so all these lattoos and all, you know, some of the ingredients in the lattoos are very good, all these nuts, all these oil seeds, but how much sugar and how much, you know, fat is going with them, so the methods of preparation can be changed a little bit and actually the needs of the mother increase after birth. You know, a lactating mother who is nourishing the child, her requirements are much higher for all the nutrients. But uh, we sort of focus again only on increase the number of her meals. But what is going in and each of those meals is not really given attention to. Is she eating more of the green leafy vegetables? Is she eating more of fruits? Just by increasing her roti, that is not the idea. Is she balancing it? Uh, I think two days ago I discussed the protein balance, you know, you mix the cereals, the pulses, you add the nuts. So that balanced diet concept stands whether it is for a pregnant woman or whether it is for your little children, growing children, adolescents, adults. We cannot change that balance. You need that nourishing balance and that is not about calories. It is about all the other nutrients. And uh, 
If I may just go back to what I spoke about that day, that plate, how it should be planned. Each meal you can plan at a very basic level without knowing the detailed ingredients and the detailed nutrient values in the decimal points. How to balance a meal? If you just walk through, uh, you know, downstairs, color your plate. Put in all the colors. Include a variety of vegetables, variety of fruits, variety even within cereal groups, pulses groups, you rotate them. As soon as you rotate them, as soon as you get a good variety, you're getting a mix of all the nutrients that you need. And as far as possible, keep the sodium, keep the fats and the sugar, the simple basic sugar to a minimum. Thank you. Called, what we call, you know, and parents ask for multivitamin pills, they always say, don't trust the pharma, trust the farm. So when I say farm, we mean, you know, veggies and fruits. And unfortunately, <coughs> in India, I think we, we live to eat, not eat to live. <laughs> we get these brilliant quotes from only Dr. Shifa. <laughs> So, Shivam, I'm coming back to you. Uh, can you tell me the impact of obesity, say, on a long-term basis and a short-term basis? Yeah. So, as I said, obesity is a disease, and when we come to the types of obesity, you know, one is related to lifestyle. So, if you have a child who is tall and he is obese, then it's more likely because of either the child is, you know, uh, eating a lot of junk food or lack of physical activity. But there is something, so there is nutritional obesity. We also have something called as uh, endocrine obesity. That means there are certain hormonal diseases like, you know, many children who have thyroid. And usually this hormonal related obesity or weight gain we typically see in the uh, teenagers, in the adolescent group. So that 9 to 13 years where, you know, suddenly there is a spurt and uh, 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 surging of hormones, what we call. So children with thyroid disorders or even off it, there is something called as metabolic syndrome. So children who have this, suddenly when they become 9 to 10 years, they have uh, basically insulin is one hormone in the body which is related to weight gain and it also controls the sugar in the body. So children who have metabolic syndrome, they start uh, showing lot of excessive weight gain suddenly at the onset of 9 years, 10 years, you know. And uh, uh, they have abnormal insulin levels. And uh, talking about the impact, there can be short term impact, uh, like, uh, you know, they become slow in physical activity because they are unable to carry their weight. And uh, they can also have sleep apnea at night because the weight is so much. So they suddenly get up in the night with snoring or, you know, a, a cessation of breathing. But it's a long term impact that is worrisome because we always say a, a, a obese child will be 100% of obese adult. So they can have a garden variety of cardiovascular disease, even heart attacks we are seeing off late in 20 year old, 22 year old. Hypertension and diabetes we are seeing in children uh, 13 year old, 15 year old. And uh, even fatty liver, you know, that is another thing uh, they can have. And the, these are all physical things, but what saddens me is uh, the emotional and psychological problem that these children undergo. That is still women because there is so much of bullying, there is low self-esteem, uh, you know, and uh, we will actually come back to that. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Bhanit Shah. I just wanted to say also when she's talking about, you know, these uh, thyroid problems and the child is a little slow or he's not sleeping well and they get, you know, a little sleepy, not very alert. Again, the solution is thoda aur khilo. Thoda glucose de do. Thoda aur sugar do. Kyunki thoda, you know, maybe energy kam hai. But it is not that. And then we, we just keep compounding the problem by just overfeeding and feeding. Uh, so, Dr. Vandita, uh, you know, nowadays there are quite a few cases. I mean, anywhere where you go, you see all these fertility clinics everywhere sprouting up, you know. So, I wanted to know is uh, body high body fat in childhood also lead to early puberty? Yes. Because uh, nowadays, you know, with as uh, you said, that uh, we have been discussing about obesity. See, in the last 25 years, there has been a huge, huge change in the appearance of the people. Now, it is, it's very hardly we see any very thin and lean people, be it children, be it females. So, all whole society is moving towards the overweight and the obese side. 
and that's creating a huge huge problem as the child is obese suppose it starts as we discussed that it starts from the womb if the mother is having PCOS she is having a gestational diabetes so obviously this baby will be overweight at the time of birth secondly once the baby is born again due to excessive amount of feeding and all people say that baby is looking chubby she is looking very cute and all so that way we pamper them a lot give excessive amount of food now this girl when she is somewhere around 7-8 years then she starts showing the signs of early puberty we are seeing girls having menses even in the 7 years now at times it becomes very disheartening to see small small kids they don't even know how to balance themselves when they start with the periods the breast starts developing the pubic hair starts coming up it's very very psychologically very disturbing so one is the obesity and the food whatever food we are giving ultimately it relates to the insulin level and the estrogen level estrogen is the female sex hormone so once the ovary starts producing these female sex hormones obviously there will be initiation of all the female uh, sexual activities like the growth starts, the pubertal development starts. So one point is there, there are certain factors which act centrally, which we call as a central causes of precocious puberty or early puberty. That means due to any reason, the brain is triggering you to produce those gonadotropins, those sex hormones, and they are giving a signal to the ovary that now it is the time you start producing all the female hormones. So in a young age also in 6 years, 7 years the hormones are start initiated in the body. Once those hormones are initiated, it is very very difficult to stop the growth there. And immediately the baby will start showing the development of the breast and the slowly the pubic hairs will start coming up. And immediately after a year or so, uh, she may start with her periods also. But then along with that there are certain foods, especially the plastics, there are certain things which mimics estrogen. They are not natural estrogen, but they are uh, estrogen-like substances. Like when we keep food in the plastic way and keep it in the freezer, or if we are using food and we are microwaving it in a plastic thing. So what will happen? There will be leaching of that plastic into the food. And this plastic thing, they act as an artificial estrogen which will act as a natural estrogen in the body. Body will not be able to decide whether this is a natural estrogen or this is a uh, something which is look alike of estrogen. So brain will perceive it as a natural estrogen. It will start producing, giving up the signals and it initiates. So it's very, very important. All the fast foods, all kind of plastics, and there are many ingredients in the preservatives which can act as an artificial estrogen and it stimulates the development of early puberty. So this we have to keep in mind, we have to shift our lifestyle from more from the plastics to the glassware and all. And all kind of uh, fast food which uses white flour, which is again an initiator of artificial white flour increases the estrogen level, it causes instrument insulin resistance. So these things, they cause uh, development of this early puberty. To add on that lack of physical activity, children don't have that much of time to play or even playgrounds are also not there. So they are all confined. So in addition to all these uh, physical things which a child is facing plus lack of physical activity and then the stress level, then the increase in the screen time, then there are sleep disturbances there. All these things are compounding. Again, if, I, if we say about the sleep disturbances, children are awake till 12 o'clock. Sometimes the adolescent age groups, they are awake past midnight also. So what is happening? There is an imbalance between the brain and the ovarian axis. So that axis is disturbed. And I have seen a case before the initiation of periods also, that girl developed insulin resistance and diabetes, PCOD at the age of 9 years old. So there are the incidences coming up because of the food we are eating, the lifestyle we are eating and also the screen time. The more we are on the screen, especially
the more is the screen time, especially after 9 o'clock. So there is a stimulation to the brain, the melatonin level is disturbed, that creates a hormonal imbalance, again give rise to uh, all kind of hormonal imbalances, PCOD and also this early, early puberty kind of thing. And uh, since because of these food habits and uh, physical activity, we are seeing uh, cases of ovarian cyst also. Not many children are coming with ovarian cyst in very young age. And these ovarian cysts are again creating a hormonal issue, giving rise to precocious puberty, adrenal tumors are there, which are creating loss of hair growth, acne, body fat. So these are all things which are interrelated and we are seeing more and more cases nowadays and more and more girls, uh, I think boys are also, since I am more in touch with the females so I can talk about them. So they are mainly uh, getting the pubertal changes very early and this is also affecting their mental health as well. Right. I would just like to add when she said about the screen time, obviously in the last two years there has been excessive screen time. So I tell the parents one simple rule to remember is how to limit the screen time is 3, 6, 9, 12. So uh, uh, before three years, uh, no gadgets. Before six years, no internet. Before nine years, no video games. Before twelve years, <laughs> uh, social media. So three, six, nine, twelve. If you know, if all of us follow this, uh, set, set this discipline in our houses, and also not more than one hour of screen time is a recommendation by American Association of Pediatrics. Unfortunately, in India, you know, uh, we are unable to get that as a policy. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, Ruchi, ma'am, you know, uh, as a nutritionist, I'm sure you must be having quite a few parents who come in and say, ki, you know, our dad and dad are all healthy, our child is healthy, how can you do this? So, tell me, is it very genetic? Do we really tend to, are we more vulnerable to carry the gene forward and become more obese if our parents are obese? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, there is a very big concern in our parents that they are more vulnerable to carry the diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It has been found that we are genetically susceptible to it and therefore we are the diabetic capital of the world today, which should make us, you know, more alert to not let it progress further. Instead of saying, you know, we are like that, we are like that, they are like that, they are like that, they are like that, because of activity levels, lifestyle. Their stress was less, their lifestyle was more active. Not in the form of going to a gym, but they were generally more active within the house, within their uh, lifestyle, and their diets did not have so many, uh, you know, processed foods, packaged foods. They were living a more uh, balanced meal. If you go back traditional, she mentioned plastics. We ate traditionally steel ki thali mein, so there was no question of all this, you know, sort of uh, plastics invasion and stuff. And uh, there was uh, more fresh food, there was more locally produced food, there was more seasonal food and all, whatever is seasonally available is obviously fresher, thereby it is nutritionally better. It has not been frozen, it has not been preserved, there is nothing being added to it, it has not been, you know, a lot of pesticides and other things put into it. So those things we cannot control, but we can control what we are eating. They managed it through their day. But uh, not only are we eating, uh, we want to eat what they eat, we want to eat more meals than they eat. Did they ever eat out? I think if you ask any grandparent, I don't think they ever ate out. Then by our generation, maybe you know we ate out a little bit. And today kids, I mean, how many times a day, uh, a week are we eating out before the pandemic? So it is, uh, I think the change has to come within the family. Right. We can't say that don't eat more than the or only the adults who are suffering from the disease don't eat more than the because the person who is planning the meal at home, let's be very realistic, this lady of the house or whoever is planning the meals, she has to plan a meal that every age group eats. And we are telling you her that you, you know, make sure that the plate is balanced and it's nutritionally fine. But if one person says, I don't eat this, one person says, I don't eat this, I don't eat this, I don't eat this, I don't eat this, how is she going to manage it? It's not sustainable. So when we talk about dietary change or lifestyle change or even including physical activity, there has to be cooperation within the family.
together at the table, you sit down together and you try and eat a more balanced meal. You try and include an activity, you know, maybe if not possible every day, every alternate day that the family takes a walk together or on the weekend you decide we will drive to this place because there are not so many places to go to but you decide you will go there, take a morning walk or an evening stroll. Include these things as a family to make it a sustainable lifestyle change, otherwise it is something you will do. How many times do we hear of people, they go pay the yearly membership at a gym and then ek hafta gaye, maybe one month there and it stops. Have to go to a mall. Because it is not sustainable, if it is individual, because let's say like today we are planning a movie outing and you are saying you want to go to the gym. So everybody has to be doing it together and you have to support the person who is making the change. You know, if you go out with your friends or you go out with your family and one person says no, I think I will avoid this. You know, I prefer a lighter something. And everybody says, Are aaj to chhod do, aaj to meetha kha lo, are koi baat nahi. No, you, you know, encourage that person, support that person and all of you also, okay, we want to have a dessert, let's share it. You know, I'm not saying everybody is going to not have it, but you share it. Instead of ordering six desserts, you order maybe two and you share it within the family. So, you have to make small changes which are sustainable. That is the only way we are going to progress towards, you know, a healthier generation, otherwise we are not. That, that what Ruchi said, that point is so, so crucial that about supporting each other. You know, often we love, oh, you're very diet conscious. And yes. So, and as uh, Anaita Man said, so I, previously we had malnutrition in India, now we have mall nutrition. <laughs> because of <laughs> the, this every weekend, you know, we get bored, we go on some outing, we go to malls, we hog, and then we uh, 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 end up with obesity. Another important cause I have seen is mindless eating. Our children especially, and even I think others, we have this habit of we are going to Netflix, Amazon, we are watching TV, we are on gadgets and then we keep on eating mind, mindlessly. So I think it should, it, it should be made as a family policy that no watching TV or being on gadgets while eating food. Also your digestive enzymes are secreted better if you are focusing on chewing, enjoying the texture of the food, you know. So this, this I have two year old who, who Mother will show some TV serials so that the child will finish eating a big bowl of kitchen and her job becomes easy. But uh, we must stop that. Right? I think we also need to add into that, ma'am, mindful portions. I mean, we yes. cook more, uh, like we're cooking for the entire building. And then after that, what we do is when the food is left, the mother says, why waste it? Are we fridge mein rakhenge, koi khana nahi khaega basi hai, and then they eat it up. Yes. So that's, I think, the other thing, or they feed the child. Yeah. In that's fact, even recycling of oil, you know, ek other than pakoda, I think that is, uh, she might say better, but recycled oil should never be used. We fry pakoda and then we keep that oil and next day if you sabji banane mein, chokka lagane mein, hoi oil use karo. That is one of the most harmful and dangerous thing using uh, 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 fried oil or recycling it. So that practice also should be. So ma'am, I wanted to uh, ask a question to both of you. Uh, to Shilpa ma'am, uh, what is the treatment for, um, you know, the obesity? And uh, uh, to Ruchi ma'am, you know, right now when I look in, uh, when I put on the television, the first thing I see is these celebrities which are endorsing these fat diets and these, you know, faulty things that we talk about. In the recent times I've heard about the uh, Dalgona coffee or something like that, right? That was a fad, I remember. Our kids were all into it. So I wanted to know from you how really uh, good are they in losing weight, which they all claim that they've lost a lot of weight. So Shilpa, I'm over to you. What are first, I would say, the what is the actual treatment uh, for obesity? So uh, obviously we avoid drugs. Uh, you know, drugs uh, is our last resort. But mainly as we all discussed in the past 45 minutes, it is change in lifestyle and change in the diet. So uh, one hour of isometric exercise is mandatory even for children, even a five-year-old. Let him go to the park and when I say isometric exercise, it's not just, you know, thoda guma ya thoda jumping jacks kiya ho gaya. No, it's not like that. So it has to be a good cardio, 45 minutes isometric exercise like uh, for uh, teenagers, brisk walking or jogging or cycling or playing badminton, swimming. For toddlers, uh, you know, it, it, again it could be cycling or something. So that, that has to be there as, it, it's as simple as taking a bath daily. I think it should be inculcated, inculcated uh, as a habit. 
Uh, and of course, food, I would like Ruchi to uh, say more about food uh, uh, as uh, you know, uh, we discussed, especially the junk food. And a lot of time parents substitute, uh, children drink very less water. This is a common complaint, especially the toddlers. So we have this habit of pani ne pira hai to juice pila diya, you know, real juices and those packaged juices. So that needs to be avoided. Let them get into the habit of directly eating fruits. Don't substitute water. Even teenagers who are into sports, you know, uh, 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 parents uh, give those energy drinks. Huh, sports drink or energy drink. Most of them contain caffeine and they are very harmful. So even at the of pediatric, they have certain uh, junk food guidelines, which I think I will give it to you and uh, it can be distributed to uh, the, all our children. According to that, no tea or coffee before 5 years of age, no caffeinated drinks before 10 years of age, uh, no sweetened beverages. Uh, so all these things uh, need to be followed. Drugs is a last resort. So when, you know, let's like suppose I have an 11 year old child who is weighing around 90 kg and there is abnormal insulin levels, high triglycerides, hypertension. So we give six months time as a, a therapeutic time to change the lifestyle, to change the dietary habits. And after that, if the BMI is same, there is no further improvement. Then we consider treating these children with metformin and few other types of drugs because there are plenty of side effects with these drugs. So we use as a last resort and we use usually not in nutritional obesity but children who have hormonal imbalances. And a uh, lot of people ask me uh, in our clinical practice, especially for the 16 year old, 15 year old, you know, when they have too much of psychological issues, they ask us about bariatric surgery. And uh, like a lot of ads uh, you see in the newspaper also in 24 hours, you know, it's like before and after. <laughs> so look slim sort of. So bariatric surgery is absolutely uh, not a safe option and uh, very few countries are doing that to the age cutoff is above 16 years of age. So we, we have had two or three children in past two years maybe we, uh, who have undergone bariatric surgery but that is absolutely the last resort because there are lots of do's and don'ts for the entire life after a child undergoes bariatric surgery. So I think it should not come to a stage where your child needs drugs or your child needs a surgery. You have to nip it in the bud right in the beginning. That is the amazing thing about these lifestyle diseases is that we can do without medicine, we can do without surgery and yet we don't wake up to it until somebody falls sick. Until somebody is sick, they are considered healthy and I think that is something that really needs to change and what I was talking about again the family you know if suppose there is a chubby child there is somebody who needs to reduce their income first of all how many meals is that child eating children need to run children need to play yes they are growing so they need to be fed and they again need to be fed not energy they need to be fed energy with proteins and all the nutrients that they need to grow just giving them something that will give them only energy, a sugar drink, they don't need that to play. You're sending them out to play so that they burn the energy which they have excess of. And then the minute they come back, you say, oh, you must be tired again, another sugar drink. Abhi football class mein dala. Okay? And before they have run and they have played and they are tired. Another thing is that many times children, especially who don't drink water, they mistake thirst for hunger. It is yeah, I mean, even adults have this. So what happens is when they're tired, suppose they have played and they're tired and they come home, they're very hungry, they're very hungry. It's actually thirst. And they're not used to, you know, giving the body that water. So the mechanism, they are responding to that signal from the brain, thinking that, oh, they are hungry. And so you feed them. Just try water. Try water, try naril pani, try even a diluted charge, try something else. It, they need the fluid and they're not realizing that they need it. Very often.
that is very important. Right? Yeah. And the other day, you know, I mentioned including foods that your child may not be eating in their school tiffins as a way of, you know, they have to eat it because there's no other food available, there's no other option available, there's nobody else in the house to say, Ketcha, bichari, ko ye ni pasan, ko ye bana ke de do. you know, grandparents indulge in that way. But, um, so if you have given some new food, you're trying to introduce a new food to your child, a new vegetable, and suppose they don't eat it in the dappa, so then they are home hungry. At that time, don't give them their favorite food. Okay, they are very intelligent, they have already registered the lesson. That doesn't and matter. And they are very good in black meat. Excellent, excellent. So they will come home and they know that mama has dappa, they have eaten anything, okay, you eat what you like, you know, at least you will get your sustenance. And they are understood, it doesn't matter, we get what we like to eat. So even on those days, especially, make sure that you reintroduce that same vegetable with whatever else you might give them, but you have to, I mean, they have to understand that this is not going to go away. This is not a one day thing, a one week thing. This first Avalon, this amazing initiative is a one week thing, but the change that it is trying to bring is not, you know, I mean, it's forever. So we have to make ourselves stronger that when we see that tiny tired face and the mama and the, you know, doesn't matter, you are still going to eat this fruit. Okay, don't like this fruit, eat a sub, you know, I mean, how many fruits are there? You don't like this, eat that. Change the combination, change the preparation, change the recipe, but don't give in to catch aaj palak nahi khaya vichara mein chalo abhi de dete hain kuch, you know, I'm going to do something with you. Schools can have, of course, like first, Arnold is absolutely a wonderful idea but I think schools have such a major impact on the child even when it comes to eating right because when it comes from teachers it's like you know the golden thing rather than coming from moms so I think we need to educate and teach it rather than saying ye, ye apple khana zaruri hai ya apple in a day keeps doctor away whatever but uh, teach them the nutritive values of the food in school we can have different kind of competition you know, poster competition or uh, uh, it's very important to educate them about the nutritive value, about the fruits, vegetable. When we are going for shopping, we take the kids. But how many times we take our children to the sabji market with us? So let us start doing that. So it becomes something interesting for them. They also learn that this is important, this is good, this is bad. Yeah, so Yes, and please. Like even in school when the children bring dabba from the school, there are so many children in the class. So one, maybe one few of them may be having a very healthy dabba. Others coming with maggi and chips and this and then the child goes back. Uski mama to school ye diya. Aap ki wala healthy food deyte ho mujhe. If we carrot sticks and this. So it's, I think in the class also the teacher takes a look. And you can give a star to the child who is regularly bringing a healthy diet. So you can incorporate that. Since you are a child who is having a healthy eating fruits and gay, so it motivates others. If she is getting a star at the end of the year, whoever is there, you can give a, uh, I mean, uh, some kind of certificate. So that will help other children also. Otherwise, the person who is bringing chips and pastry and all other things, they other. They are demotivating the other one and they are coming back home and they are cribbing. You are the mom who is only after the healthy eating. The rest of the mom is so cool. So, they exchange. They are exchange. So, the thing is, these are the upper learnings also from our kids. I mean, these things should be done. So, that the teachers can play a great role in that. Absolutely. Coming back to Shilpa, you know, ma'am, I completely agree with you when you say that children rarely listen to their parents. So when I was yesterday talking about this, that you know, tomorrow I'm going to be a moderator, she asked me this one question, my daughter, that uh, why should I eat healthy food when I'm so lean and thin? Yes. So now I'm waiting for an answer to yeah. give her. Yeah, so rightly uh, said because I, want, I had totally forgotten to uh, so, a lot of time, again, vice versa, you know, we, as we say that uh, uh, a child who is overweight and the percentiles means obese, but let me tell you that lean necessarily did not mean that the child doesn't have tendency to go towards obesity because there is something called as familial hyperlipidemia or, you know, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, where the person, the 
a person might have a normal BMI, but still will have high level of cholesterol, abnormal level of insulin. And also it is not about the cosmetic appearance or the weight or the height. You know, uh, when we talk about lifestyle, it when we say health, it, it, it's not just the weight or height, it's actually the, the vitamin levels in your body, the energy levels in your body. So you might have a 40 kg child, but if the child is not exercising or not eating right, the child might not have good energy level, so it's actually an unhealthy child. So health necessarily doesn't mean a appropriate weight and height, it means much more than that. So yes, even if your child is lean or you are lean, that doesn't mean that you know, oh no problem, you can hog on to all the uh, savings. So, right. Thank you ma'am and uh, you know coming back to Ruchi ma'am, uh, ma'am I think we had this discussion about uh, something which of course is not related to being uh, obese but I think today's world is a fat phobic society where we look at uh, people and start body shaming them. Can I get your views on that? Right. So when we are talking about little children this doesn't apply but I think as they are going into middle school and then especially as they enter their teens and with this uh, social media invasion of our lives, the image of a perfect body type, a perfect body shape. Um, for both boys and girls. For girls it is getting into a size 0, size minus 1 or whatever they are headed towards these days. And for boys to appear muscular. You know, so they sort of by discussing with each other or being influenced by social media, they start making their own changes to their diet, what they think will work. And uh, this ends, I mean, anorexia and bulimia in spectrum uh, eating disorders but it happens they will not they will give up protein they will give up anything that they feel is happening okay? they, they don't know what to give up what not to give up so they will give up whatever they want and uh, they will stop eating they will feel uh, negative if you say something so because it's coming from the friends who know everything and who are of course the we uh, all so um, they what happens is they not only they might not reduce their calories but they reduce their other nutrients. So they might still not see weight loss. After these all these changes that they're making, they don't see weight loss, they will get further depressed, they will get, you know, they will try to try out other things. And the minute you see that there is this weight loss product in the market, let's try that. This one worked for this, this one worked for this. And fat diets, th this juice worked for somebody. Not for somebody with what? Did they also walk? Did they not walk? Somebody might say, this is not working. Exercise is not working. I'm going to go for a month, I'm not going to go for a month, I'm not going And another thing is, when you make these changes to your lifestyle, they don't show up physically first. It's a metabolic health we're talking about. Internally, your you know, insulin sensitivity is right. All your hormones are fine. All that we cannot measure and you know, show somebody. So girls go into this fat diets, I mean I don't know how to tell them not to, but uh, it's again it comes back to the school to sort of give them the, you know, gradually give them the information if they know, suppose they do want to lose weight on their own, how to go about it, which are the high energy foods, which are the uh, uh, high fat foods with hidden fats which we discussed the other day, that it's not just ke parathe pe ogi lagaya ke nahi. many foods have fats within them and you will continue to consume them. So you will not see the desired change and then they go on restricting their diet more and more and more. They suffer, you know, they don't have the energy levels to do their daily tasks, their daily studies and it just impacts them. And the other side which I was talking about, boys, protein. Protein shake low, protein powder low, you have 5-5 five, five kilo boxes and they just, irrespective of whether they are doing any activity, are they actually doing any intense training, weight training, what are they eating the rest of the day? Do they need that much more protein, which mostly they do not? Again, it may just be a, a diet which is imbalanced and with higher energy than protein. And they just want it added. I have had many children, young sports people especially, okay, you know, I want to take a protein powder, just tell me which one. They don't want me to see what they are eating. They don't want me to tell them what to eat. They just want me to tell them, yeah, protein powder, lo, pele lo, patme lo, and life is fit. And lot of very very nephrotoxic that has made damage to 
they damage the kidneys so much. Um, we have done a study in the last four years we have been doing in this age group, 17 to 21 age group. And we have documented high creatinine levels in so many uh, boys, you know, because uh, uh, the, the kidneys are unable to filter and uh, even consuming for three months, six months, they end up with lifelong kidney damage. So please beware if your you know, children get into these fats of uh, uh, protein diets. Again, when you tell your child, you tell them that you are obese or overweight, they suddenly go on a diet. So I want to say that dieting mat karao, that, is, that should not be the solution, you know. You, you can't have a 14 year old just eating those sukha roti in a day and a bowl of salads and just boiled corn. Because then after 3 months they come with low hemoglobin, low vitamin B12 levels, uh, uh, you know, low protein levels they come with. So I think it has to be a systematic approach, you have to consult your uh, your physician, your pediatrician, your nutritionist and a, uh, you know, a exercise instructor and, and a daily log is maintained. We ask these children and parents to keep a daily log. And there is something called as RDA, recommended daily allowances. Unfortunately in our household and in our country we don't give any importance to uh, RDA. When we say fruits, so we give five, five fruits in a day. Well, so, you know, there is no balance. So it's very important that according to the age, the child gets uh, RDA of calories, proteins and vitamins. Right. And moreover, when we mostly the social media and... Uh, so much is talked about uh, obesity and uh, how to lose weight and all. People who are going to lose weight because they, th th they think that thin is the thin thing. Okay. So until and unless we make them aware that lean is not always healthy. Because there are lean people who also have their set of problems. When we talk about lean people, they have more of inflammatory problems. If the obese one is having a metabolic issue and gaining too much of weight, the other lean one may have more of inflammatory problem, more of adrenal problem, thereby leading to all kind of hormonal imbalances and they also for, fall in the category of hormonal imbalance once they are in that group. So we think we should uh, talk more about the problems of the lean individual. So uh, the people who are obese and going for fat diets and gymming, they will understand we need to take a guidance before we go for any kind of fat diet or Which any kind be, of so in dieting also also we have seen that the girls are not eating at all just because they want to lose and they become want to become size zero we have patients who i mean they fell into this anorexia category went for liver failure uh, kidney failure and at times there are not many other issues and we lose also those things so we have to be very very cautious ki if the uh, uh, teenager is into a dieting or if she or he is uh, thinking that he is overweight, he needs the help, please uh, take, take him to the doctor if he needs the mental counselling with any kind of psychology because psychology plays a very very important role because what my peer group is saying. So that has a more impact, then they start searching all these things in the social media and then they feel helpless and they take any kind of diet plan. Also for the gymming, very young age if they go for the gymming, as we see girls who are having PCOD and all, the doctor says you need to lose weight. A 16, 17 year old girl goes for a gymming and finally she goes for a high impact uh, kind of training and suddenly she has a spine injury and the whole one year she is on bed. So please be cautious if the children are going for a gymming also, if she is very young or he is very young. We need to have an adequate instructor who should know the anatomy of the, of the human body. The gyms they may not be having good instructor with a good qualification. So suddenly a 16, 17 year old goes and says, Mujhe to weight loss karna hai, mujhe doctor ne weight loss bola hai. And the instructor says, ye bhi karo, ye bhi karo, ye bhi karo, then there is a damage in the spine, damage in the knee. So we need to be very, very careful when uh, children are opting for gym at a young age, opting for any kind of fat diet. So we have to support them and also mentally also we need to support them so that they can choose the right thing. Right.
Thank you, ma'am. And I would like to thank all the panelists that we have here. Thank you, dear audience, for patiently listening to us. I'm sure that uh, today we've actually got to know what is obesity and the implications that it has on our children's health. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Thank you. rightly said, thou should eat to live and not live to eat. This thought very well resonates with everything that we heard from our esteemed panelists. I take this opportunity to express our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to our honorable speakers for enlightening us with the physical, mental and emotional effects of obesity and ways to overcome it. bringing us out from the disillusionment that being chubby is being healthy. May we all express our gratitude with a huge round of applause. And I'm going to compliment both of you because I can't imagine that at that age when I was or when we were, you know, this is the uh, typical trademark abnormal student. student. I think uh, hats off to all the teachers. So I was actually uh, telling the Simi ma'am yesterday that uh, maybe next year's was Avalon instead of calling us, uh, you know, they can call the Avalon alumni who are doctors now. Uh, please, uh, the audience, please scan the QR code at the desk outside to give you a valuable opinion. And we request the audience to remain seated while the panelists. Thank you, Thank you, you ma'am.